truth seekers to yet another episode of the straight shooter show we like to thank everybody for joining us don't forget to like share comment subscribe say it again with me like share comment subscribe my name is todd braley and with me as always the thunder from down under itai guberman all right, we have a very special guest on here with us today. His name is Mars Roberge. Mars, how you doing today, man? Thanks for uh, joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice to finally meet you, Itai. And uh, nice to meet you too, Todd. I've nice. talked to Itai for what, since 2017. We're internet friends, but we haven't met in person. This is as close to person these days as we can do, I guess. Yeah, what I call face-to-face. <laughs> Well, not so much uh, in person. Yeah. Mars has got uh, some some amazing projects that he's put out. And um, I was just I was just introduced to you a few days ago, um, which I'm sorry to say, I wish I would have been introduced to you sooner. But um, I was able um, I had some time and my wife and I checked out uh, one of your flicks, uh, Mr. Sister. I'm just going to tell everybody get your ass on Vimeo and watch that movie. That's all I'm going to say, because it was, it was hysterical. It it was awesome. It was heartfelt. You know, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I just had to talk about that movie real quick. Thanks. Got into things. Yeah. Yeah. We enjoyed it a lot. It was, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. So Mars, if you would do us a favor, man, just uh, tell us a little about, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background, how you get into filmmaking, some of the things that you've done to get to get to where you are uh, today, if you wouldn't mind doing that. Yeah, so I uh, grew up in uh, Scarborough, which is a borough of Toronto, kind of like Brooklyn to New York. Um, went to film school in 95. I graduated York University uh, Film School just in Toronto. And, uh, you know, worked in in the industry doing everything from, you know, your your PA at first. And I was like, there was a music video boom going on at that time and kind of graduated to becoming like the first assistant director to Jesse Torero, who ended up making the movie Soul Plane with Snoop Dogg. But I was on his first music videos. And that's kind of where I learned the whole like planning shots, you know, where you got a $5,000 music video shot in 16 millimeter film and and they want to look like $100,000 and shoot 20 locations in a day and I just carried that with me I was an editor for Canada's busiest music video company called Black Walk Productions and then I was a grip IATSE permittee uh, working on movies for a while and I worked for John Gadecki, which was the biggest uh, visual effects company in Canada it's no longer but uh, my job was to bring a truck and, and sweep up the explosions and put all the models back in the truck and drive away and that's kind of that was my job and uh during that whole time, I was a DJ in like the gothic scene in Toronto, which was, I had a name called DJ Mars, like an undead DJ. And, and DJing to me at the time and playing in like glam rock bands like the Millionaires and stuff, there was a, a scene like that on Queen Street in Toronto. That was a little more important to me than film at some point in my life. Uh, I was like in my 20s and I just stepped away from it and basically almost partied myself to death, woke up in a blackout in New York uh in 2000 and started DJing SM parties there and working at a drag queen clothing shop I remember looking out the window of the drag queen queen clothing shop and seeing this uh movie called Glitter being filmed outside with Mariah Carey uh-huh. and and I had all this makeup on and I was like I was like uh working with the drag queen selling clothes to Britney Spears and people like that for minimum wage I'm looking out the window at all these kind of redneck grips and stuff and I waved and they didn't realize I was working with them about five months before that in in the woods in Canada and here I am with this new life so yeah. <laughs> so then so then for the next 10 years I worked as a stylist for Patricia Field, the Sex in the City stylist. And uh, we had a lot of big customers, like famous celebrities and stuff come in. I was DJing s and parties and I was, uh, you know, uh, playing in bands as part of Larry T's Electro Clash, which is kind of like new wave revival thing going on. I had a band called Rise NYC. And during that time, uh, I got back into editing because I realized, wow, you don't need a 50000 or $100,000 room where you have grass valley root switchers and like you're, you're, you're not using scopes to color correct. Like there's a thing called Final Cut Pro that 
new people are using on a computer. So I read a book, retaught myself how to edit, and then just started making weird uh, multimedia backgrounds for every show because all music was electronic. So it would be like, instead of singing and playing along to a CD, I did it at the time to DVDs, which would play behind me. And I was just basically make experimental movies that played behind me. I, I wish I could say people came to see those movies. I don't think anybody even realized they were there, but that was like, got me back into it. And right. then one day I was hanging out at an event, at a, which would be at a nightclub called The Bank in New York. It was called Element then. And uh, Patricia Field had asked me to uh, put together some stuff editing wise uh, to, of, of like their world to play out on a screen. And, and I did. And, and I stood around like uh, Paul Alexander from this band, The Ones, and all the people from the House of Field. And they said, somebody has to make a movie about this. Somebody has to make the Patricia Field movie. And there was this girl that was interested uh, in doing it. And I said, I would help her. And then I, on the first day she got so stoned, she walked off the set and we never saw her again. And next thing I got into taking over this movie covering 60 years of a store and all the secrets to the underground in New York. And that became the little house that could. I moved out to LA, finished doing that. And then I needed a job and thought, well, I got a degree in film from like 1995. Maybe I can be an editor somewhere. I think they want a kind of more current resume. They don't want like a 15 year old void <laughs> where it shows that I'm using <laughs> like, old, you know. yeah, where it shows that I edit on uh, flatbed editing suites and stuff. There wasn't too much of a demand for that at that time, but uh um, I did get a job at Nomad Editing Company as a digital asset manager, and I've been there ever since, and it kind of keeps me in the post world. And then I just started making films after that. I made Scumbag, uh, uh, at, at, which was uh, about, it was about, when it was it basically summed up in Toronto. At one point, I got sick of working on music videos and putting phone numbers on infomercials. My boss said, do you want a party? Do you want a career? And I left. <laughs> I said, I got to use a bathroom and I walked out of the career and walked straight into this awful telemarketing company with all these crazy people. And that became the story for what scumbag was exactly like I lived that story and, and the little house that could is technically my life after the scumbag story when I moved to New York and Mr. Sister, my next film was a film that I basically took the the humor from scumbag and the cast from the documentary, the little house that could have blended them together and came up with this thing called Mr. Sister, uh, anti PC comedy about a straight drag queen. And then the current film is stars, which is, uh, it's a, my first serious drama, black and white drama about homeless women in New York. And it was uh, based off of a play by my friend, Doron Bromstein, who also was a club kid. I was a club kid in New York at the time uh, as well, um, which basically meant glorified drunk that got paid a hundred bucks to show up and drink for free in a bar looking weird. You know, it was a pretty great career, actually. I liked it. <laughs> a lot of people flocked to New York when they heard that you could do that. But, uh, you know, I'm actually sober today, 22 years, but because, you know, I can't keep affording to. I can't afford to keep waking up in other countries. And the next one would probably be in Australia, waking up on Itai's sofa, saying, yeah. all right, I live with you. <laughs> we did this interview and I live with you. Um, um, yeah, my but, sofa uh, is very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the part of the Zoom interview is I get to live with you for free for the next 10, 10 months. Um, it's in the contract. So yeah, that, that would have been how I would have taken it back then. Well, so, it's my contract. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so stars is in post-production. Uh, technically I've, I've submitted a work in progress. Uh, you know, it's my version of the film minus a proper sound mix, you know, which we will be rushing on if we get in the major film festival. So I'm just waiting on the, that right now, but we could be playing as early as September the 2nd. And while that's going on, I actually, I counted the other day, I got five films in, in, in uh, that I'm working on. I've got, uh, uh, one film's a, a, a suspense thriller that I've been working on for years and I actually had to go back and uh, change a bit because some of the stuff that was fantasy actually happened, you know, with with Black Lives Matter and Atifa and everything else that happened in New York becoming bad. That was a fantasy that I made up in the story and all of a sudden it started happening. I'm like, well, I don't want to look like I'm, I'm basing this off of reality because this is almost like a horror film. So I've got to go back and tweak that right. script right now and, and and then 
uh, I also um, I have a horror comedy, which is the same humor as Scumbag and Mr. Sister that I've been uh, I'm about halfway done. I'm in pre-production for I say pre it's a little bit of research uh, freeway Rick Ross. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they made a TV oh, yeah. show called Snowfall. Well, Ooh. he's my producer <laughs> out of South Central, and he's funding my next two films. And, uh, you know, one of the films is uh, a film he wanted me to do, um, which is uh, uh, he, he every week he's been putting me together with uh, some of the original founders of gang culture for L.A. from the early uh, from the late 60s, early 70s. And they're all telling me their takes on how it all started. And it's not in the history books. Nobody's ever covered it. Imagine the movie Colors, Your Boys in the Hood and go back about 30 years. And that's what this movie yeah. is. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's one of these experiences that I've never had because, you know, going i have to these guys will not leave the hood to come and talk to me i have to go to the hood to meet them and, you know i've been to east harlem i've been to harlem i've been, even been through detroit but it's a whole other world like when i'm in in the hood of, of south central there's been times where i'm like what well, would be safe for afghanistan or here right now for me you know like we were in a bullet we were in a mcdonald's i didn't even tell my wife this but we were in a mcdonald's the other week and it all had bulletproof glass like you had to reach through a thing to get oh. And, yeah. and as these guys are telling me their stories, they're like, yeah, a lot of people want me dead. And every guy that got walked into that McDonald's afterwards, reaching into their pocket, I thought, wow, I've never been in this Everybody's situation researching a script, but I might have to jump for cover, you know, yeah. constantly. It was like, it, so that's how, well, that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, uh, and I, uh, you know, I like to film on location, but that's going to be a whole world, new world of security filming on location there because a lot of people don't want this story to be made. Like there's like a yeah. lot of sex and the sex are all mad at each other. And if this sex doesn't get to make it, then screw this sex. You, you shouldn't make it either. So, you know, uh, uh, Rick what? Ross is kind of like Sweden in a way or Switzerland, I mean, but not a hundred percent. And what? I said to him, I said, am I going to get, uh, is this safe for me to make this film? And he said to me exactly this, you should be okay. I think if they're going to go after anybody, it's going to be this person and they won't know what you look like. So, you know, me being an egotistic director, I say that because you make a film, you want to go to a million screenings, you want to stand there and talk about the movies, do these interviews. Right. I might not be doing that with that film. But what, what happened is that film is also giving me like funding for this other film where I'm doing a movie on a real life uh, New Jersey mob mobster that's telling me his whole life story which goes back to early days of him even dealing with uh, uh, Malcolm X, like friends, you know? So it's like, I got an original story there um, right. that I'm excited about. And, and when I, I, I'm hoping bigger things happen for me because, you know, I, I make these films and I use, I use friends and I use people on a low budget, but that the mafia story definitely needs, um, it definitely needs, uh, it definitely needs like, you know, A-listers and stuff. It's like on a Scorsese or, or, or Coppola level because it's a story that's never been done. But I don't want to take um, the script and give it away. I'm a filmmaker. Yeah, I don't want to give this. this don't don't give everything away. Don't give everything away. Is, well, let me... is, that, is that world famous you're talking about? The what? Is that the title, uh, the film titled World oh, Famous? So, so I, I'll go into a little bit about that. So World Famous, which I'm changing the title, and that is going to be about the mafia guy. But it was originally, mm. I had a film all ready to go about these early rappers, you know. And, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to name them, but I've never been in this situation where I presented the money. I presented the idea. I told them how we're going to do this. And then all of a sudden, the manager jumped in and said, oh, that sounds easy to be a filmmaker. We're going to do it ourselves. Thanks, man. And, and disappeared. <laughs> so that's when I went back to Rick and I'm like, wow, that we were going to do this. What's going on? So he's like, OK, we're still going to do something. You're going to need this gang film. And then I'll, I'll fund your other film. So so that's what's happening right now. So so there's that. And uh, I also have another friend in, in Germany that gave me a play that's really funny that I said, if I can do my horror comedy, uh, if I... I the locations that I'd be using, uh, one is a hospital uh, room, hospital area. I could easily spend another two days and go and make your fi feature film too, you know? So it's like, why not bang out two films at the same time? So, so that's all what's going on with me. So it's kind of like rolling the dice. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not hoping for the one thing. If the one thing doesn't work, I'm like, well, I got these five, you know, let's let, which, which one are, can we do right now? We got to do something.
you know? So, well, that documentary, so the, the documentary on the gangs, um, Oh, it's not a documentary though. I'm well, getting the story film. and I'm going to do it as a biopic. Oh, and I, okay. and I, and I, okay. And I also told him, I said, look, in my past, most of my famous people in my films are musicians that just want to act. You Crips, do you have any music, any rappers that you could send my way? They're like, we could probably get Snoop Dogg. I'm like, I, I can't <laughs> afford Snoop Dogg and I can't afford, I can't afford, that's a Hollywood movie. I can't do that. And he's like, oh, he'll do whatever Rick Ross says. And I'm like, what? You <laughs> so you never know. You never know. Well, you know? I mean, that's kind of well, if you're if you're doing the, a biopic kind of situation, then that's, you know, I mean, Allison Anders did that a while ago um, back in uh, God, what was that? It was the early 90s when she did Mi Vida Loca. And um, and uh, I, I understand what you're talking about, because I grew up uh, in Diamond Bar, California, and we went to school at uh, Ganesha High School, which is in Pomona which was like the dead center for um, Crips and Bloods. There was Cherryville. There was uh, Happy Town. There was Sin Town. It was. And so I went to school with a lot of gangbangers and who actually got to be better friends than the people that I lived in my neighborhood. Most of the guys used to kick my ass in the neighborhood and the uh, the gangbangers were actually the good guys. So um that uh that i i kind of like i kind of if you got a place for somebody for a for a crew guy for that one i would love to be on that one okay so, cool i'll definitely definitely just, just letting you know you know just throwing that out there in <laughs> fact i'm going to la here next week to help my kids shoot a music video so um but that i i, I like the sound of that one it's um uh, not that i don't like the sound of the other ones but that's just when you said that i went oh yeah yeah as you're talking i'm thinking yep yep i know that i know that yep the mcdonald's yep i get it and no, uh, it's definitely good to know because like that will be one of the films will be like look who's who's not afraid to come on <laughs> you know like it's a whole other deal like it's like well, uh, it's a different it's gonna be a different take and you know? the thing is you can't go on there with the thought process of being scared you know i mean that's that's uh you know I, I I don't know, you know, what your, what your thought process and what your feelings are like, but it's just something that I learned growing up. Cause I grew up around it in the high school that I went to. And, um, it's just kind of one of those things. If, if, if the, they can smell the fear and it's just better just to be, just be you. I mean, that, that's kind of the thing that, that I, that I really learned from a lot of the guys that I went to school with. And a lot of these gangbangers that I went to school with, it was just, they were all very, um, just be yourself. And that's, that's better than trying to put on a face or, you know, um, you know, just, just treat them like you treat everybody else. I mean, yeah. Okay. So you got to look over your shoulder once in a while, but outside of that, you know, I was working with a handful of guys, um, a few years ago unfortunately the guy was killed so we didn't go any further with it <laughs> but um yeah yeah that just that that kind of stuff and i have a story like that myself it's actually something that happened to me in high school so it's uh that one sounds really really interesting so kudos to you for being able to get something like that done yeah thank you you know uh like, like just doing the research uh I show up to places. I'm kind of scared. I'm looking over my shoulder, but the stuff's so interesting that these people are telling me that I'm like, wow, I got to write this down because it's not in books anywhere. I need to, and right. I forget where I am. I, and they're like hours passed. And I was like, wow, I forgot how long we were here. You know, it's right. Uh, right. So now what gang are you dealing with, with, you know, are, are they black gangs, Mexican gangs or all gangs? I mean, are you looking into the Crips? And I, I, I'm dealing with Crips. So I'm dealing with the original members that, that are still gotcha. alive. Okay. The original. There were uh, 50 to 100 people originally, and I'm dealing with the ones that were within the first 10. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I'm envious of that. So, yeah. And yeah, I mean, if you got if you got a place in the crew for, you know, an old fat guy, let me know. <laughs> in an ideal world, I'd love to shoot this in 2023. So maybe towards the end of 2023 or the middle, Okay. you know. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hit me up. So we'll, we'll stay in touch for sure. I'm all, I'm all in. It's I. Um, no, I'm just thinking as, as you, as you were talking about everything that, that, um, you know, that you've done since the beginning, there's just a, there's a lot of different things there, you know, it's like for the yeah. DJ, the bands, um, stylist, you know, filmmaker, um, it's sort of a, a doubly question, but what came first and, and which do you connect with most? I mean, I, I half assume it's filmmaking since this is where you are now, but maybe not. Um, anything on it, that? It, it, it's weird. You know, my, in my younger days, my passion was I wanted to be a musician. I played guitar and I, I would sing and I program music. Um, but uh, I also was a bit of a loner and people caught on to the fact when I was in high school that if I had book reports or I had to do a creative writing gig or, or I had to like present something, I would go up with a blank sheet of paper and I would make something up on the spot. And I usually <laughs> did pretty good and kids caught on to that. And, and I, I'm like, I don't can't really do too much, but I, I have a lot of dreams all the time. So I like, and then I saw some kid with a film school pamphlet and I was like, film at the time it wasn't yeah i watched movies as much as other people i had ones i liked and stuff you know every kid's a fan of star wars and jaws but i wasn't like this is my life but then like when i needed to go to university for something that's when i was like you know i wouldn't mind doing this film making thing and 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 uh and and at the time there was like new filmmakers tarantino and spike lee and harmony corinne just all came out right at the same time and i kind of like Mm-hmm. kind of want to be like these guys, you know, and start reading their books. And so when I was younger, uh, I, my passion was the music stuff and the DJing stuff. Now that I'm, you know, I'm turning 50 in November, you know, um, film is good. You know, I'm, I'm starting to lose my hair. I'm wearing, I have to wear glasses now. And I even <laughs> wear hats. I think like uh, I'm finally fitting the filmmaker molds. So now it's time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, I had to get ready for it, but I'm kind of glad I did wait because I see how much work is involved, like compared to making an album or, or recording a song. There's so much work involved. I've, I've pretty much first AD my own films too. I've produced them. I cast them. I'm the editor, the assistant editor, the location manager, like everything. That's how these films get done on the, like on the low scale. Um, so, so I, uh, you know, uh, I couldn't have done this when I was drinking and partying and wanting to be a DJ. I would have quit after a week. I would have said, screw this. You know, it's too much work. So much now work. it's like, <laughs> yeah, I got the time and I, I'm ready to put in the time to do it. And it is a lot of work, but I like it. Like my my week, I actually plan out like because I'm working on five scripts. I got I work on a different one a specific day of every week and I make sure I work on it for at least an hour or two. And and I, I have something going constantly like um, right. my 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 narcotics anonymous sponsor who's not around anymore uh basically said you got to have a reason to get up every morning no matter how impossible it seems a goal even if you don't make the goal it gives you a reason to get up and that became filmmaking for scumbag and i have never stopped since you know and that's like it's almost like i do it to stay alive it's weird you know yeah yeah i know i'm 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 36 years sober after, oh, cool. I, yeah, after I quit DJing. So uh yeah, I get it, dude. I'm with you. i I I get it. I know exactly what it's I'm, what it's like. I'm 48, I'm 48 years sober, so I have both of you beat. Oh wow. <laughs> I'm, oh. I'm 48. <laughs> That's my age. That's all. <laughs> have um, you never have you never drank a tie or no, I drank, I drank. I was just never um and never had a problem in that sense because I was never a big, a big drinker. I'm, I wasn't uh, either. I'm a, big I I a nightclub DJ. And when you become a nightclub DJ and people are bringing you shots as tips. <laughs> yeah, then, no, for, for me, yeah, for me, that was university here in Australia where it's a big drinking culture. Yeah. So I say for, for two out of the three years at university, I was, I was pretty much an alcoholic in, in practice, but not so much uh you know needed it or anything like that it just ended up being that way because of in, in the first year i didn't drink at all and i realized that i'm just standing on the side looking at everybody thinking how stupid everybody looks and then i thought but then again i'm not having any fun 
So um, yeah, <laughs> maybe I should just uh, get get in on the on the on the practice and see how it goes. And I did have a lot of fun, but I stopped drinking as soon as I finished university. So well, yeah, as- you know what? Like I was I was the opposite when I when I was in high school. I looked pretty normal. I skateboarded. Uh, as soon as I got in film school, I was like, I got the blue hair. I wore the suit with the safety pins, and I started drinking with all the kids from Degrassi Junior High because they were they were in my dorm. <laughs> And uh, I said, I just want to fit in. And uh, it wasn't before long. I was taking acid and throwing snowballs at professors that teaching night classes, you know, like it was like a went full on. Wow. <laughs> all or nothing, you know. You, I was going to uh, say, you went all in, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and look back. Nice. To, had to. Yeah, well, it's just I, good I mean, to, I, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the delay thing happening. Yeah, now you go. go. No, I was I was just gonna say, you know, I only I only drank heavily, and I don't know how long you drank, and and did your your stint there, Mars. But I did it like I only did it three and a half years. I was the same way. I was the skateboarder, and I did, you know, I learned. I started DJing when I was um, fifteen, and. Uh, by the time I was turned 21, I was in the, in the nightclubs and doing that kind of stuff. This was the eighties though. So, you know, it was, I was, you know, there was, there was a lot of, a lot of stuff going on in the mid eighties, mid to late eighties. So, but uh, yeah, when somebody asked me why I quit drinking, I would just tell them I wasn't good at it. You know, <laughs> yeah. For me, it was it was ten years. It was really just it was the ten intense years. You know, like uh, yeah. and, and 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 the smoking went hand in hand. I smoked two packs of cigarettes. I remember being After such a that, smoking too. addict that I would have to set my clock in the middle of the night because I knew I had to get up at a certain time to smoke more. <laughs> like, it was that bad? Wow! Uh, I never yeah. did that. I just woke up. Yeah, I've never heard of anyone doing that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think I'd ever be able to stop. That was a hard one. I never want to mess with that again. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I haven't smoked in what twelve years, thirteen years now. It, it's uh, yeah, man. I feel listening to you talk. It's kind of like I'm going. Yep, I did that. Yep, did that. Yep, I did. This is your life. Is this guy know yeah, me? You guys are just <laughs> just making me uh, just making me miss uh, smoking now. <laughs> I, only, I only did it socially, but but socially with Israelis, uh, you know, uh, it means every day, most of the day. So for yeah. a long time. Yeah, I don't miss smoking uh, at all. I don't miss. Oh, I don't that miss. reminds me of a of a question I had. Um, the the writer of Stars, Doron Bronstein. Bronstein. Yeah. Bronstein. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Israeli name. I was just wondering if he's also. He lives, uh, he lives in. He lives in Israel. I think he lives in Tel Aviv or just outside of it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, cool. I knew, met him in New York, but he had moved there from Israel and he moved back. And my other play that I might be doing is by another Israeli Israelite <laughs> that now lives in Germany. Um, so, yeah, I only work on yeah. screenplays done by people from Israel. <laughs> I guess I'll. I guess I'll have to write one for you then. Being a French Canadian, that would be what I do. Yeah. So, so I'll just well, have to start working on a, on a Mars Roberge script. Yeah, there to complete go. the set of Israelis. There yeah. you go. There you go. So, talk, let's talk a little bit about um, the little house that could. Um, so, you were saying that somebody bailed out, and you wound up having to take it over. I mean, what? So, when you took it over, what was the, what was like the first thing that you you were you started thinking? Oh shit now I got to do this. I mean, is that so, how it went? Am I, am so, I missing? So I realized like the person that w- wanted to do this, I don't know if they wanted to do an experimental movie or whatever. I took it as a documentary. So I was like, we need lights and let's put these two people and I'll ask them some questions since I, I have a background doing college radio for a long time too. <laughs> Me too. Um, and then they got stoned and then cu- didn't come back, you know? And, uh, and had no interest in doing it after that. So I was like, wow, I just interviewed people for something. I don't waste their time. So let me just keep going and interviewing more people and doing this. And, you know, at the time, the subject, uh, the main person, Patricia Field, she was known for not letting people interview her for documentaries and stuff. Like there were uh, all these stories I heard. 
So I almost had to do it behind her back. I had to make a documentary about her life behind her back where she didn't realize I was doing this and she never gave me the time of day to interview her. When I finally interviewed her, it was with uh, an Android phone hooked up with clothes pegs on a shopping cart. And we did the whole interview like that with wow. natural with natural lighting. Um, but it ended up, you know, uh, you know, let's just say I heard that as of this month, there's a movie being made called the Patricia Field documentary. And there was also another movie called Love is the Ball. And I wonder where they got their ideas from. I, I heard I heard one of those films has the exact same people I interviewed in the exact same kind of locations and went and, and actually used the exact same archival footage. So wow. I, I don't know. It, I can I can focus on that, but I'm on four films from then. I wish them a lot of luck. I didn't make any money off of it, <laughs> but it was for the it love, that's what I did it for. You know, it was a cool film, yeah. and and the people that I interviewed, a lot of them aren't alive today. They can't get those interviews, you know. And uh, at the time, nobody was really doing anything in New York. Like I knew about Harmony Corinne. And, uh, the, you know, those people all left New York. There was nothing going on. So it was me with SD cameras, two SD cameras, playing Big Shot Director as they're on these crappy home tripods, interviewing people, stealing electricity from a wall to plug them in, and, uh, and, and just interviewing people with a light as uh, police would drive by and assume I have a permit. And I would do that at all these big parties. I'd pull people outside and interview them. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of stuff that nobody got you know and i'm glad it inspires other filmmakers to go out and do stuff today i i have to laugh like one of these films that came by my 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 attention this week which i won't name it's let's just say it was in what i just said it, on imdb it says projected like projected uh profits 40 million dollars or whatever i'm like and they got famous people but i'm like wow you know, uh, I'm glad I inspired you. It happens a lot, you know, so it's like, I guess keep inspiring some people to make the same films later. And, you know, I don't have the money to really go and sue these people. Not to say I would, it's a documentary, but like when my narrative film, Scumbag, that's a whole other deal, um, which I can't go too into, but like, you know, somebody made 18 million bucks off that script, you know? Um, anyways, uh, I just go, well, maybe I'm on to something. I gotta keep making films. Eventually it will turn around where I'm not in the hole constantly making right. these movies, you know? Right. Yeah, I, I get it. Cause I just, I, I've, I have yet to make a project where I tried to raise money for it. I think the only thing that happened that, that, that worked on was, uh, the surviving the undead TV series that I did. I've raised, I don't know, like two grand and that didn't even pay for hardly anything but yeah i feel you but you know what though i mean it's i and i have had this conversation before too but you know and it sounds like with you it's it's just like you know what it, just keep going you know i mean you don't that's, that's, yeah yeah it, you just you just don't seem like the kind of person you you kind of seem like again i just i kind of feel like there's a mirror going on here you know and in you're just kind of like, you know, okay, well, you know, I could do this. I could spend this time here. I could do this and fuck it. I'm just going to go. Never mind. It's funny. I thought about something as you're saying that I'm like, well, I keep getting ripped off. Um, if I make a film where the Crips are really happy, will people want to rip me off then? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. You know, maybe it's protecting me against Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding, huh? I think we'll always we'll always get ripped off in one way or another if yeah. something that we do is successful or somebody else thinks they can make a successful version of it. Right. So, you know, these days you can't, you know, copyright too much anyway. Yeah, it's these... like TV shows. I, I, I'm not a big fan of TV. Even when they say, oh, this, this is as good as movies. I'm like, most of the time I'm like, well, you say that. But I would feel ripped off if I just paid to see that in a movie, you know, compared to what's out there. Mm. Or, or I think it was a cliche because they're so mm. worried about making money that they use so many cliches all the time. It's like hard to I haven't found a, an original TV show that's 100 percent original. Like, I'm yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they, always, they, or, they play play it pretty safe or they have or they have so much source material that they could choose from and they choose to try and make up their own shit star wars and um you know and and they and they just 
mask it up every time, <laughs> you know, it was, it's just, it's mind blowing to me when you think about all of the books that have been written in regards to star Wars. And I hate to, I hate to revert to star Wars, but I mean, that's, you know, when they put out the Mandalorian, I was like, wow, okay. Somebody's thinking. And then they did book of Boba Fett, which I was stupid excited for. And was just, it just felt like somebody kicked me in the head after watching the first couple episodes. And, um, it's you think about all of the books that have been written and all of the books that have been on like bestseller list, you know, the, the original star Wars, um, not, uh, you know, novels that were written after the, the first three were made and the amount of source material and nobody uses it. Everybody decides, Oh, well, we're just going to make this. Oh, we're just going to do this. Oh, we're just, why don't you guys. And, and I'm with you on the TV series thing. It's, it's like, come on, use the source material, you know, it's, it, it's, yeah, it made money for a reason. So I, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I have been, it's like I've been at, I, I edit my movies and I edit them fast, you know, and I won't, I won't go into specifics, but you know, I have worked with people on the commercial side mm -hmm. and they are so damn slow. And I'm like, why are you so slow? And it's because they're used to somebody paying a lot for a commercial where they got to purposely redo it a million times to, to make ends meet so that they, they get paid their full amount by wasting time. And I'm like, right. wow, so you're just wasting you're you're a time waster. I'm not a time waster. I have to be very efficient in what I do to save money, you know, and, and it's, it's been really frustrating. And with with TV shows, I once told somebody like I. I'm not really into collaborating with writing. Like I don't want to write a script with somebody because they're like, why not? Why not? And I'm like, cause it doesn't take two people to hold a pencil. It'd be hard to write with two people holding the pencil. And that's how I feel. I feel like everybody's going to have to be like, but I have to ha get a say too. And it's like, well, why? Like it's from somebody's brain, let them finish what they were saying. You know, like, how are you going to tell them how to think? You know, it's, what it's hell, weird. What, what the hell's a pencil? <laughs> I'm old school, man. The, the last time I used one was a long time ago. It's the thing. Yeah, I'm not talking to, to what stab somebody in the f eye with. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's funny when you were talking about um, editing and and uh, you know the the turnover speed, basically how quickly they get it done. I would always, uh, I'd rather pay more to someone who can get it to me fast. Not someone yeah. who's going to take ages to, yeah. to get it done. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it, it's weird that 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 world has this mentality. We like to let it breathe. We like to come back to it. It's like, why? You know, go, go take a smoke break and come back and work on it. Because, you know, in general, like I do my own assisted editing. You know, I had help on this last one because I was forced <laughs> forced to use final mm. cut x uh i'm a premiere person you know i saw the, the good things in both but uh you know it took me a little longer to get used to and uh, little things but uh um the one thing I'll, I'll i'll say is usually from the start to finish even including transcodes i'm done my edit i'm done my movie uh for, and post in two months you know that's my good and i work day and night i got nothing else to do that's what i do you know i work mm -hmm. from home and i work on these and it takes me two months. It shouldn't take you nine months. It shouldn't take you two years. You know, maybe if it was a documentary where you got like 10 years of footage, but yeah, that's so it's, it, it, it's frustrating for me. You know, I don't like working like that. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I make, I, I yeah. worked for tel uh, the television stations here in grand junction since like 1999. And um, I learned how to, I had learned how to edit tape to tape originally. And then uh, I worked at a post-production post facility, a couple of them actually, in Hollywood. One was in the Centrum building across the, the freeway from uh, Universal Studios. And then I also worked at Hollywood Digital, which was just off of Sunset and Coanga. And um, so I learned how, and they were still using tape back then, even though it was all, it was a digital system. They were still editing off of, you know, three quarter inch, uh, what was it? Uh, D2, which was a, a digital uh, format, digi beta and stuff like that. And so I, I learned how to edit, you know, via that stuff. And then when I got my hands on Adobe Premiere 3.0, um, 
you know, somebody told me somebody didn't understand how I could edit and get cuts on on tape so close together because you weren't supposed to be able to do that. And um, the guy that was cutting uh, Men in Black was doing a a rough or the the rough cut at our at our facility at Hollywood Digital. He, uh, he told me, he says, dude, he says, when you get your hands on like an avid system or something like that, he says, you're going to be fucking, you're going to just, you're going to go nuts. And I'm like you, when I started, when I moved out here and started making TV commercials, I was like, I sat down, boom, 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 get it done. You know? And there were other guys that I worked with that literally would look at me and go, how in the fuck can you get that done so quick? I'm like, because I already see it. And, and to me, it's like, you know, I've got three more commercials to do and we got clients to satisfy and we got these things that got to get on air. So, yeah, I mean, Mars, I'm with you, man. It's like, why take your time on this shit, get it done so they can get it on the air so they can start paying so you can get money, you know? And yeah, I think they get paid by days. So they want to go, it took us three months to do this, which I can mm-hmm. understand from it. But, you know, just pay the person more, <laughs> pay them three months, pay to get it done in a week, you know, like yeah. uh, stop wasting time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's where I'm uh, pretty jealous of you guys um, because I got into filmmaking fairly late at a fairly late age. I never learned, um, you know, the technical stuff, uh, editing and all of that. So I edit in theory but I have to get an editor to do the work for me because I just have no skills in that uh, area. But if I did, I, I know the turnover would be much faster. You save a lot so, of money. Like I can't imagine yeah. paying myself to work on something for 600 hours over time or whatever, you know, like it would just be crazy. So, you know, um, Absolutely. well, and you think about, yeah, the guys, I, you think about the filmmakers out there or the guys who make films that can't edit their own stuff. They don't even know how to edit i mean they wouldn't know the first thing and and that was something that you know i just was when i got into this i was i learned everything you know i wanted to know everything i wanted to know how to set up lights i wanted to know you know as far as lenses go in the camera and and, you know it was just one thing after another after another after another you know and you i grew up kind of poor so you know um i didn't I didn't have the advantage to be able to uh, get my hands on stuff until I got older. And my mom worked for the, the McDonald's uh, production studio in the city of industry in LA. And, um, and uh, that's where I got to learning about a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, I was also into the DJ thing at the time and, and women were a big deal. So um, I kind (laughs) of let that fall by the way. So yeah, well, you know, when you're a DJ and, and it was just, it was about the girls and playing music. And I thought, you know what? Somebody asked one time, what's it like to be a DJ in the eighties? I said, well, it was the closest thing to being a rock star without having to uh, play an instrument. So (laughs) it's, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I still, even, even when I fell away from it, I was still learning. I, I never stopped you know, loving the filmmaking process. So yeah, I mean, being able to us being able to edit our own stuff is huge, you know, because I would huge. I, well, I'm only for for the first time we did a film back in uh, March or February of this year. And um, I handed it over to my son, which I never hand my shit over to anybody, but my kid, is following in my footsteps and he's actually a better editor than i am and so yeah yeah the the whole editing thing i'm sorry i went on a tangent i apologize hey hey, you you mentioned you you mentioned city industry and that brought up i forgot to tell you so my wife and i who who acts in all my films deborah hayden um Mm -hmm. we have a record label a vinyl record label that we started last year called world domination record um and I, I put out my old band Rise NYC from New York, like music that I never released with like people like David J from Biohouse doing a remix with Genesis Peorage, who died from Psychic TV, doing a remix. And her album is a dance album, you know, uh, Skunk in the Roses. But we put it out and I was I had to look for like record stores where I could sell this, you know, dance record stores, not just a rock 
collectibles, right? And one of the places was out in your city industry. So we got stuff for sale at this place called Dr. Free Cloud, which I think is the last standing rave record store in California. And yeah. it's kind of, I think it's yeah. pretty close to, to city of industry. Yeah, out it there. is, and, it is. Uh, I, know, I know what you're talking about, man. That's... That's, yeah that's cool. you can go in there and see records with stickers that say from the movie mr sister or from the movie scumbag and it's like in that store right now right on right on yeah oh that was the other thing that my wife loved the music in mr sister she mm. loved the music so there is a soundtrack for that that you can buy well there's uh there's an album called there's an album called um the the artist is skunk in the roses which is my wife and the the uh the album's called rabid perfume um there's record stores all over the world that sell that record and um that has the song sad sad vampire which we made a music video which is the girl singing in the movie mr sister that song a very showgirl cabaret oh, song fun. and uh and i also have a song in it uh which was a remix by genesis peorage um which called rock and roll manifesto and it it's uh it's the scene there's a scene in the movie where the guy is uh in a leather le leather in a leather bar in the bathroom doing drugs and the song that plays at that point is on this single that i released and the b-side has another band i had called binary star system remixed by david J. and that those are yeah those are for sale in fact i have a website world domination dot pictures instead of dot com it's dot pictures all one world one word world domination dot pictures and our record labels there with uh links and stuff too so people can go get it online get the mp3 or get the actual vinyl uh, yeah. are there any um uh, plans to release uh, mr sister soundtrack um, well, no, the, the closest is those two songs that are available on stuff. I, I always have a hard time, like with Scumbag, um, we had 40 artists and like a lot of really famous uh, artists with songs and everybody was willing to like try to do this uh, idea of a soundtrack, but nobody wanted to make the contract and nobody trusted any kind of contracts. Musicians are more paranoid than film people with this stuff. And it's like, yes. well, you tell me, because I would put this out if you're cool with it, you know, but like nobody really wanted to do it so much. Like they wanted to, but they didn't want to commit. So, you know, there's not, uh, the closest to that is, uh, I don't know. I, I plan to be putting out a bunch of singles that were used. Truth is, like in the 10 years I was doing in music in New York and the, like the five years in, or, in, or the 10 years in Toronto, um, I have all this music that's never been released, but I've almost used all the songs in all my movies once now. So I'm going to hopefully slowly start releasing more stuff. And on every album, it will say, hey, this song was on this movie or this song was on that movie so that's one way around it but like it's hard for me to deal with other artists that and their bands and stuff to say let me put out your music i i think I, the mo the best i've done is uh i did one of those uh uh pandora playlists or some spotify playlist you know for the films of, of stuff that's out there but yeah <laughs> All right, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That was part one of this episode. Part two will be coming up very, very soon. So look it up on the Straight Shooters YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. See you soon.